Hello, and welcome to On Air with Aiken Gump. I'm your host, Jose Garriga. Brexit is now squarely in the UK's rearview mirror. As of January 31st, the nation is no longer an EU member state. Among the many changes that may unfold as a result of this rupture are those involving the UK's system of justice. We're welcoming back to the studio today Aiken Gump litigation partner Mark Dawkins and senior counsel Sheena Budev. You may recall their appearance on the show last August in which they discussed the potential impact of Brexit on dispute resolution in the UK. Well, now they're back to brief listeners on dispute resolution in this post-Brexit environment. Welcome to the podcast. Mark, Sheena, thank you for coming back on the show uh, today. So I think the first question on listeners' minds, particularly outside the UK, after January 31st, may have to be, what changed? And then, what does this mean for the UK's justice system? Mark, if you could lead off with your reply. Thanks, Jose. Yes, so indeed, what did just happen? As you say, with effect from 31st of January this year, the UK has no longer been an EU member state. Although there were some celebrations and some people shedding tears, if you had blinked, you might actually have missed it. This is because although Brexit has happened, Nothing has in fact changed yet. So we are still obliged to conform with EU law and regulation. We still get the benefits of free trade, free movement of people and free movement of capital. And we can still take our pet dog on holiday to France with a pet passport. And all that is because we are in what has been called a transition period. The transition period expires on 31st of December 2020 and is intended to allow the UK to remain fully within the warm embrace of the EU whilst negotiating over its future trading relationship with the EU. However, let's make a prediction. You may recall that towards the end of last calendar year, there was a huge amount of press coverage around threats of a no-deal Brexit in the UK. Well, I would predict that all the heat that arose late last year in relation to the no-deal Brexit will be repeated in much the same way towards the end of this year. And that's because the UK government has laid out its approach to negotiation in some detail, and it's clear that there are several yawning chasms between the UK's position on a future trading relationship and that of the EU, particularly in relation to what have been referred to as level playing field measures, and I'll come back to those a bit later. So it remains to be seen whether these yawning chasms can be bridged by negotiation. But particularly bearing in mind the personalities in Boris Johnson's government, there will no doubt be brinkmanship up until the last minute. So that's all really political background. And what we want to talk about is the law. And as you say, Jose, in particular, the impact of Brexit on the UK's system of justice. So has anything changed yet? Well, not much. The EU laws that applied to the UK prior to Brexit remain in force and will continue to apply in the same way that they always have until 31st of December 2020. During the interim period, uh, and under the transition arrangements, the framework for civil justice and judicial cooperation continues to apply between the UK and all EU states. So that framework covers determining which courts have jurisdiction, ascertaining which law applies to contractual and non-contractual disputes and obligations, how to effect service of proceedings overseas within the EU, the basis upon which judgments will be enforced, and obtaining evidence from overseas within Europe. Now, in summary, as you would expect, the pre-existing EU framework, which continues for the UK during 2020, facilitates and simplifies and sets out clear rules under each of these five areas. That framework will continue in force throughout this year. Understood. Thank you. So... One thing that you mentioned was a transition period. What exactly can listeners expect will happen during and then after that time? Shino, if you would, please. Sure, of course, Jose. Let's divide it up into two issues. First of all, choice of law. I suspect commercial parties will be concerned about whether their choice of English law will still be recognised across the EU, and if they'd previously chosen English law to govern their contracts before Brexit, Will it still be the right choice after Brexit? And you may recall we addressed this first point um, in our first podcast, and the short answer is and remains absolutely yes. 
The rules governing recognition of contractual choices of law within the EU are governed by a regulation known as the Rome 1 regulation. This makes it clear that the EU courts must respect choice of law in contracts, even if that choice of law is in a non-EU state. That regulation will not change after Brexit and will remain binding on EU member states. Having said that, Rome 1 will disappear from the UK statute book at the end of the transition period, at the end of this year, but will be reincorporated into UK law under the terms of the relevant Withdrawal Act. Turning secondly to recognition and enforcement of English court judgments, again, you may recall that in our first podcast, we explained that as matters currently stand, the UK is part of a pan-European regulation called the Recast Brussels Regulation. And under this regulation, a judgment in a member state is enforceable in any other member state without any formal declaration of enforceability being required. By virtue of being a member of the EU, it is the UK is also a party to the Lugano Convention, which is largely similar to the Recast Brussels Regulation, but to which Norway, Switzerland, Iceland and Liechtenstein are parties, and these are EFTA states. So, during the transition period, all English court judgments will continue to be enforceable in the courts of the EU member states and the EFTA states in accordance with these regimes, and judgments in each of the member states and EFTA states will continue to be enforceable in the English courts. So the big question is, what will happen after this transition period? So at the end of the transition period, the recast Brussels regulation will be revoked and cease to apply here. However, the withdrawal agreement clearly provides that the recast Brussels regulation and the Lugano Convention will continue to apply in respect of English court judgments obtained in legal proceedings commenced before the end of this year. So if parties currently have proceedings on foot in England, And if there is a future judgment which needs to be enforced in one of the member states, EU member states, or one of the EFTA states, the regimes currently in place for reciprocal recognition of judgments, as I've just discussed, will apply. The regulation and the convention will not, however, apply to judgments made in legal proceedings commenced after the end of this year, so after the transition period. So for parties who are currently negotiating contracts, and who wish to include an English jurisdiction clause, they need to bear in mind that if they do end up in some sort of dispute with their counterparty after the transition period has ended, an English court judgment will not be recognised and enforced in the EU member states under the current regimes. But all is not lost, so let me explain what could happen. Naturally, the UK hopes they'll be able to reach an agreement with the EU on a future relationship, which will result in the UK signing up to the Lugano Convention in its individual capacity rather than a member of the EU. Now, that's the UK's aim. Mark has mentioned that, you know, that that no doubt there'll be some sort of brinkmanship, but one will hope that common sense and pragmatism will prevail. If, however, a negotiated exit is not possible... I think the question, to be, the question that everyone's asking is, what will fill that gap? There are two possible um, answers to that. One is the Hague Convention. And again, we mentioned the Hague Convention in our first podcast. So where a contract contains an exclusive jurisdiction clause entered into after 1st of October 2015, the Hague Convention provides for exclusive jurisdiction clauses to be held upheld in the signatory states and for enforcement of judgments concerning contracts containing such clauses to be a relatively straightforward process. And the convention is currently in force in all EU member states, as well as Mexico, Montenegro and Singapore. The UK has has deposited an instrument of accession, and in the event of a no deal, it will accede to the convention in its own capacity. There is, however, some debate about whether the Hague Convention will apply to exclusive jurisdiction clauses agreed in contracts during the current transition period, when the UK is not a party to the Hague Convention in its own right. We hope and expect that these sorts of creases will be ironed out to ensure that exclusive jurisdiction agreements do not fall into some sort of void or gap. And I'll come to um, practical considerations as a result of that shortly.
in terms of the, the second option is member states' own laws on recognition. Uh, the position is not quite so straightforward where parties have a non-exclusive jurisdiction clause in their contract. In the absence of an exclusive jurisdiction clause, English court judgments will be enforceable in all EU member states, not in, not in accordance with the Hague Convention or any other regime, but um, in accordance with each member state's own domestic laws. One would therefore expect all English court judgments that were previously capable in force of enforcement under the recast Brussels regulation or the Lugana Convention to be enforceable, but under the local laws. And as a consequence, the process may not be quite so streamlined and quick, but nevertheless, that judgment will be capable of enforcement. Thank you, Sheena. A reminder, listeners, we're here today with Aiken Gump litigation partner Mark Dawkins and senior counsel Sheena Budev discussing um, dispute resolution in this new post-Brexit environment. So let's follow up a bit on what you were talking about. Sheena, you alluded to this. What are some practical steps that listeners might take if they are, in fact, entering into a contract during 2020? Sure. Um, And reflecting on what I've just said, firstly, consider making um, your jurisdiction clause an exclusive English court jurisdiction clause so you benefit from the Hague Convention. And I mentioned this gap that parties may fall into. Erring on the side of caution, you may wish to consider including a term in your contract which requires the parties to restate the clause after 1st of January 2021, once the UK has acceded to the Hague Convention in its own right. So that's one practical step. Another step is that the parties may wish to consider an arbitration clause. With arbitrations, enforcement is more certain because of the um, New York Convention. But there are disadvantages to arbitration over litigation, and we find that it's all too easy for commentators to suggest that arbitration and litigation are interchangeable. But in our first podcast, we explained why international businesses for many, many years have always favoured English courts, and those reasons should remain at the forefront of parties' minds when considering the forum they wish to choose for the determination of any disputes they may get embroiled in. Thank you, Sheena. And I would suggest listeners take a listen to that initial podcast. It was very informative regarding the topic and made a very persuasive case in that regard. So to wrap up, what should listeners be looking forward to and looking out for between now and the end of the year? Mark, uh, what do you think about that? Well, this update has really been to keep listeners in the picture. And I think as everyone will have gathered, the legal issues that we're addressing and which is really as you said at the beginning jose it's about the impact of brexit on the uk's system of justice that's pretty much been left in a holding pattern whilst these heavily politicized trade negotiations proceed i mentioned earlier that we could expect some brinkmanship towards the end of the year however it's quite possible there will remain real divisions of principle between the uk and the eu which can't be reconciled or at least not during the transition period Boris Johnson has made it clear that he prioritises UK sovereignty ahead of free trade with the EU. And what that means is he does not want to accept what's been called the level playing field that the EU say they require. And under that level playing field, in order to get free trade, the EU say that the UK would need to comply with all of EU regulations and standards so that goods and services will be guaranteed to match the the EU standard. But um, Boris Johnson doesn't want to do that. So if he doesn't move, and if the EU don't move on their requirement, we are very much back to the no-deal scenario, which um, I mentioned earlier and we discussed in our podcast late last year. But as we said then, that doesn't mean that the system of English justice as a forum for resolving international disputes is in any way materially impaired. All the qualities of independent and experienced judges, adaptable common law, transparency and efficiency remain unaffected. And as Sheena has just explained, there are very likely going to be good answers to questions around the enforcement of English court judgments in EU member states. However, it may well be the case that it's more difficult for me to take our Jack Russell on family holidays to France next year. Thank you, Mark. And let's hope that scenario does not come to pass because no one wants to put a Jack Russell out. As a terrier owner, I can speak to their single-mindedness. Thank you both. Listeners, you've been listening to Aiken Gump litigation partner Mark Dawkins and senior counsel Sheena Budev.
Thanks for appearing on the show today and bringing our listeners up to date and up to speed on developments in this post-Brexit world. And thank you, listeners, as always, for your time and attention. Please make sure to subscribe to On Air with Aiken Gump at your favorite podcast provider to ensure you do not miss an episode. We're on, among others, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. To learn more about Aiken Gump and the firm's work in and thinking on dispute resolution, look for International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution on the Experience or Insights and News sections on AikenGump.com, and take a minute to read Mark and Sheena's bios on AikenGump.com. Until next time. On Air with Aiken Gump is presented by Aiken Gump and cannot be copied or rebroadcast without consent. The information provided is intended for a general audience and is not legal advice or a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship is being created by this podcast and all rights are reserved.